Morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, so sorry. I'm Joe. I'm a senior producer at Ardman. And yes, Luke is over there from No Ghost. Uh, we're going to share this talk together to talk about developing the immersive world of Wallace and Gromit, more specifically, the immersive world as it manifests in the Grand Getaway, which is their very first uh, VR-arama adventure, which I can never quite say, but coming to MetaQuest platforms uh, very, very soon. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Wallace and Gromit and kind of what it means to the brand to be able to tell stories in different ways. Uh, a little bit about some of the top line kind of priorities we had in making decisions for translating it to a new format and then Luke's going to deep dive in some of the uh, creative and production decisions we made along the way. Um, but before I kick off I guess first thing is does everyone know who Wallace and Gromit are? I'm assuming most of you that's probably why you're here it's not for us um, but just in case you don't know who they are or you need a reminder let's have a little video to kick off. Rolling around, Gromit. Ah. Hopefully you know them already, but uh, if you didn't, you get from that. They are an iconic British duo comprised of Wallace, who is the sort of mishap-prone inventor who creates contraptions and creates catastrophes, and Gromit is his put-upon dog sidekick, who with a roll of his eyes and a sigh kind of has to go around and put things right. And for over 30 years, they've been entertaining audiences, primarily through the films, that's probably where you know them, but as you saw from that video, we've also told stories with them in lots of different ways and formats. They've been in adverts, they've been in rides, they've been in escape rooms, they've been in games. Um, we at Ardman just love finding opportunities to share these characters with the world, give people a chance to connect with them and their adventures. Uh, and of course, we're always looking at technological ways of doing that as well, um, particularly in my team, which is the games and interactive team at Ardman. Um, so we specialise really in using technology to um, create character stories, uh, create worlds, give audiences the chances to get closer with them, whether it be in-house brands like Wallace and Gromit or Chicken Run or Creature Comforts, uh, partner brands because they trust us to look after characters and world building, and whether it's in-house or co-productions like we've got here, we always like to find opportunities and setups to let us do this great stuff. Now, with Wallace and Gromit specifically, the last big thing we did with them in the immersive space was the big fix-up. Again, I would normally ask if anyone had had a go with this, but it's an augmented reality experience that effectively used your mobile phone and mobile phone technology to let you take part in a real-time story that played out and brought the characters into your world. And almost as soon as we'd completed that, just by chance, we were uh, approached by Atlas Five, who are our wonderful publisher on this. They are a French company who specialise really in finding and creating and developing and supporting rich narrative-led VR experiences. And so they came to us having worked with No Ghost before and said, hey, would you like to do that with Wallace and Gromit? And of course, for all the reasons I just said, we said, yeah, absolutely. Although not without trepidation because, you know, Wallace and Gromit is a much loved brand. That is great, but that brings creative baggage for better and worse on the one hand, Lots of goodwill, lots of reference, lots of great ideas to start from. On the other side, a lot of pressure not to muck it up, particularly when they've come from a world that is much more traditional, as you saw, like it's linear, it's clay, it's stop motion. You know, translating that into a new format, not just creating a world, but translating a world is its own challenge. And thankfully, with, with No Ghost, we had the perfect partners with which to tackle that. But to make sure as we went through that we as Arben were keeping the core Wallace and Gromitiness, if that is a phrase, to the experience, we sort of set out with a, a bunch of principles, four principles that we wanted to kind of keep in mind as we made some big decisions about how this uh, adventure was going to shape up. 
So the first was that the heart of everything had to be character and story, which I think everyone says, and it's often thrown away as a platitude, but it, it means a lot, particularly when you're coming from an IP that people have a potentially over 30 year relationship with. They have expectations of their adventures, they have expectations of their relationships. So if we throw that all away to go into a new format, that's really gonna kind of destroy the heart of what makes them work. Um, so one of the first things we did in terms of story was think, well, what is gonna make the best of VR in terms of what it can do in transporting you places, playing with scale, but that honors Wallace and Gromit and feels like a Wallace and Gromit adventure. So we went back to the very original Wallace and Gromit film, The Grand Day Out, where they take a rocket to the moon to find cheese, and said, well, actually, let's go in the rocket again, and we came up with this holiday goes wrong concept. So essentially, they take the rocket to blast off on holiday, and in a very characterful way, if essentially, things go wrong, they crash land. Wallace, true to form, is oblivious, travels around Mars thinking he's on holiday, Gromit realises, no, this is a problem, needs to fix the rocket to get back. And what better format to kind of allow existing fans to go to locations they already love, and what better format for new fans or people that don't know them to kind of experience that world in a very immersive and all-encompassing way. So that was the story side sorted, but character-wise, there's their dynamic, and the challenge we had with VR is, well, who are you in all of this? The big difference between a kind of passive watch it on a screen thing and a virtual reality headset where you are in the world is that you're an active participant. So you need to kind of have a role. And our first thought is, well, Wallace and Gromit experience, you've got to be Wallace or Gromit. But actually that throws up problems in terms of the world in that, well, Wallace is an idiot. We love him, but he's an idiot. So if you are Wallace, that's slightly difficult for the player to have to think, well, hang on, am I pretending I know stuff Wallace doesn't? Am I role playing as someone silly? Gromit can't talk to me. That was yeah, an error we felt might disconnect people. But likewise, if you're Gromit, which is great because he's a fixer, he knows what's going on, you can roll your eyes at the nonsense Wallace is saying. The problem is you never then see the dynamic of the two of them together. And so our solution, and Luke's gonna pick up a bit more on this, was to create a third character, a contraption that Wallace has invented to go on his holiday with him. Uh, that is the autocaddy, he's a sort of like golf contraption. And that enabled us to kind of give the audience a place in the adventure where they could see the two of them interacting in the way they expected. And as soon as we kind of came up with that decision, it unlocked a lot in terms of interaction and the vibe of the experience. Now, the next thing was that it had to be fun and funny. Um, again, if you know Wallace and Gromit, hopefully you know that, but their world is not just funny filled with slapstick humor, but there's lots of throwaway jokes, there's lots of visual gags, there's lots of spoofs. So we created a script that had that in, but also we embraced the fact that virtual reality lets you be in a space. So the things like joke book titles and funny pictures and funny products that fly by in a moment in the film, we could really reward uh, players for, who are in the space by kind of hiding cupboards full of this kind of stuff, having bookshelves full of funny jokes. So instantly that was a really nice way of enhancing one of the parts of the world in the immersive format. But then the other challenge was kind of in terms of how you made it fun and funny with what you're doing. Um, one thing we were really keen on is that you never did something that was so silly and took you out of the story. It was really important that you always followed this narrative thread even though you've got interaction. And so it became a work of not just crafting a set of narrative beats, but an experience with beats of moments where audiences could kind of do silly things that continued the story and felt characterful. Like for example, being Wallace in zero gravity, zero gravity, You've got to have puns as well. Trying to make um, a cup of tea, trying to butter cheese and crackers and things. And that became a really nice moment. I mean, you put people in the headset, you see them smiling and it's great because it does exactly that. It's fun, it's funny, but it's fully characterful. It's fully progressing the story. And it makes a really interesting kind of moment. Third thing is it needs to be Wallace and Gromit, which is obvious and is kind of covered by the other two, but I mean visually, aesthetically in terms of feel. And what's really interesting is over 30 years, actually, if you put everything together, they are quite visually different. I mean, to go to the original film through to say, Where Abbott or, or Match of Loaf and Death, one of the more recent ones, they look quite different, but they all feel consistent because they are physically made. They have that tactility, that physicality. And so the challenge we had and that we put on No Ghost was, well, when we're doing this digitally with virtual stuff, how do we kind of, you know, smooth out, smooth out the edges, make it a bit rougher, have that equivalent of fingerprints all over it. So obviously we can literally do that with materials, but also just in terms of how do we give everything that sense that a human being has crafted this exactly like they would have done on the films. Uh, and that meant, you know, scale, it meant choice of materials, it meant choice of movement. So one of the things people often ask is like, oh, so you're doing, you know, clay stop motion. Like, well, no, it is fully digital, but we are using a stepped kind of staccato style to make sure it feels like Wallace and Gromit. But that's not without its challenges. I mean, those models, that world was obviously designed to work on a certain uh, frame and a certain setup. Like Wallace, if you put him in a T pose, is massive. If you're in a physical virtual space with him, he, he fills up a room. If you are him, his hands are massive and you kind of cover your whole face with them. Uh, Gromit, you rarely see go from four legs to two legs and yet in an immersive world where we don't want cuts, you kind of have to keep him alive and make those transitions work. 
there were a lot of issues we kind of had to navigate along the way, but it basically came down to making sure it felt right and that everything had had that kind of human love and attention. And the final thing is it had to work, it had to be good, which is obvious, but there is a rich legacy. We didn't want to be the ones to muck it up. Uh, and also we're fans, you know, we are fans, and this is a great opportunity for fans to engage. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever we created felt authentically Wallace and Gromit and fun. And the challenge we had in the immersive space is a lot in the films is done in pre-production. It's animatics and it's storyboards and it's planning. And you can do that a bit with VR, but so much of it is how it works in the space, in the physical space, almost the virtual physical space. And so often the directors had to use kind of more theatre techniques of choreographing attention and getting things up on their feet before we could decide what worked and iterated from there. And that was a lot of pressure. But thankfully, we had the perfect partners in No Ghost, who I'll hand over to in a second, to kind of take our early ideas, our early principles, the existing rules of the world, and take it from an idea through to a, a virtual reality. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Joe. So, as Joe said, I'm Luke, um, co founder at No Ghost. And yeah, so uh, Ardman kind of set us this challenge of bringing Wallace and Gromit into the virtual world. And when we first started working with them, it was kind of immediately apparent, as you can see from how Joe has talked about the characters, the, the love that they have for them, um, the kind of the familiarity and the attention to detail that they have uh, is so, uh, so intense that we knew we would have to, you know, have this big challenge on our hands to, to live up to their expectations and make sure we are doing the characters justice. Um, so yeah, as, as Joe has kind of alluded to, um, our task was to take these characters and, and take them from a flat screen format, bring them into a world where you can actually interact with them and you can interact with their world around them and be a part of that story, which was kind of a, a nice sort of evolution of, of their, their story. Um, so yeah, going from a sort of a screen space world that's fundamentally passive to a 360 world where everything is one-to-one -one scale and you're active, an active participant in it. Um, so luckily for us, uh, as Joe mentioned, their world is, it feels like you can touch it anyway. It's kind of everything's hand-built, everything has this aesthetic of uh, kind of real materials that um, we had to kind of recreate in 3D, recreate in a game engine, and make sure they were kind of living up to that, um, that tactile feeling. So the, the key difference between the Grand Getaways of VR experience and Wallace and Gromit's animated adventures is that interaction and the gameplay that we're, we're bringing to that. And in that, we had um, a kind of a careful balance to strike between challenging the player, uh, introducing difficulty to the gameplay, but also keeping the story moving, keeping the pacing, um, and making sure that uh, people are kind of engaged throughout the experience. So this required a lot of iteration, a lot of testing, which is uh, sort of a new way of working um, for Ardman com when compared to, to animation, and something that we had to kind of work early on to kind of keep that uh, flow of prototyping going. So, yeah, we had to prove to ourselves early on how it was going to feel to actually be one-to-one -one scale with these characters. So, as Joe mentioned, Wallace's hands are sort of three times the size of a normal person's hands. So, as soon as you kind of get into a, a room and see him at your eye level, it kind of immediately you've, you've got some decisions to make of how you show that, how you choreograph everything, and how you set up the room. Um, the other thing that you're kind of working with is when you see the, uh, the 2D films, they you know, everything kind of has this sort of toy town feel because it's, you know, the models, literally you can hold them in your hand. They're about this big. And we were lucky enough that Ardman let us play with all of these models, let us kind of get a feel for how they work, how they, an how they animate, how they can move and articulate. Um, and that really helped us with recreating those props in 3D, recreating those CG assets so that they would feel authentic, feel like you actually could reach out and touch them. Um, so. Yeah, the first task that we had was to build the interior of, uh, of the rocket, although that slide doesn't show it. I'll just kind of go back there. The interior of the rocket um, from a grand day out, which was you know, an amazing challenge for us to see all the artwork from uh, the original films, which obviously Ardman still has all of those uh, kind of original assets. And being able to translate those into, into 3D assets was a really kind of amazing process for us. Um, we found that the easiest way for us to kind of prototype uh, the space and the layout was to use VR tools like Gravity Sketch to kind of sketch a layout with the directors, allow them to kind of 
get in the space, get a feel for how, you know, how things are, how, how big all the props are going to be, how big the characters are going to be relative to you, where they need to stand in order to make it feel natural. Um, and we found this on, on various you know, VR projects. It always helps to start your prototyping in the medium that you're actually going to deliver the final product. So doing this in VR from an early stage um, was super important for us. Um, so yeah, as Joe mentioned, there's three characters that you can play as, so Wallace, Gromit, but then also the auto caddy. Uh, and you know, this was a, a really good opportunity for us to explore the different characteristics of each of those characters and give, your, give you, the player, a different abilities based on who you're kind of inhabiting in that moment. So Gromit is kind of, he's the hands-on fixer, so he's always using tools to fix things. Um, he's, he, you know, he always wants to make sure that everything's working. The auto caddy, he's a robotic invention, so he's got kind of these unique abilities to do sort of extendable grabbing. He can teleport to kind of allow the player a bit of locomotion. And Wallace, uh, as Joe mentioned, is kind of mostly useless. Um, he just wants to, you know, put cheese on his crackers. He wants to have his tea and he doesn't really know what's going on. So you kind of have to lean into that when you're uh, you know, designing the scenes around playing as that character. So these different motivations and capabilities means you know, adding variety to the gameplay. So as, as you go through the different sections of the story, depending on who you're playing, you're going to be doing different things which are very specific to that character and have those unique moments that interact with the story. And yeah, having the auto caddy really meant that we could explore more kind of animated comedy that feels like the core of the Wallace and Gromit uh, IP. You can have them interacting with each other, joke, joking around, and sort of have those little moments where Gromit's eye-rolling at Wallace, and, and we can still see that through Auto Caddy's eyes and, and be a part of that experience. So to weave all of these kind of different aspects together, we have uh, a virtual assistant, Beryl, and so she's making her second appearance in the world of Wallace and Gromit uh, following the, the Grand Getaway AR experience. And she serves as kind of a, a, a bit of a narrator, but also a helper. She points things out to Wallace. She points things out to the player. And we knew as, you know, Wallace and Gromit is a family IP, we're going to have a lot of people who are experiencing VR for the first time trying this. We have to cater for kind of a really wide age range. So it was a big, uh, a big moment for us to, to have uh, that, that uh, guide, that, that kind of help for the player if they need it. And the way that you can interact with Beryl is you just sort of wave at her like this. And that was uh, a way that we can kind of bring those human interactions. Everybody's familiar with that anyway in everyday life. It kind of it, it helps it to be more of a seamless experience where you can get help if you need it rather than it being sort of forced on you. And there she is. So yeah, the, the challenge, as Joe alluded to, of getting the characters to really look like the original clay models was, that was a, a huge thing for us. We, we knew that we had to make it feel really like it was the world of Wallace and Gromit. We did a lot of work. Um, we used Unreal Engine for this pro project and did a lot of work on the materials to make sure that, you know, we get the fingerprints looking right. We get all the materials that are on the props looking right, all the, all the metals. So it looks like an actual model that somebody has made. Um, so we then had to move to Mars, which is a hugely new environment for, for Wallace and Gromit, for the IP. It's kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit in terms of, um, yeah, the feeling of, of what is, is natural in that IP. So we had a, a really sort of careful balancing act between making this fantastical landscape, but also uh, having it feel like it belongs in that world. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of challenges, lots of uh, things to overcome, but, um, you know, it was a, a very rewarding experience for all of our developers. Amazing working with Arman and Atlas V to, to kind of bring this to life. And so, yeah, please do add this to your wish list. That would be a massive help for us. And uh, thank you very much. We have Thanks, questions. James. We don't have a lot of uh, time, but maybe a couple of questions. There's one here. Uh, what was the length of the production? Uh, how, how long did it take you to make it? 
what are we saying, 18 months? Yeah. Okay. There was no, Ish. Yeah, there wasn't a tremendous amount of pre-production. It was um, a lot iterated as we go. We quite often referenced uh, the wrong trousers where Gromit's on the train, building the train tracks as he goes. It was basically that for 18 months. But um, it's a really rich, you know, several hour full length experience um, with lots of replayability. So there was a hell of a lot in there, but great team. There was a couple of questions here. Somebody raised a hand before. No? Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, so, so you talked about like having the, the Hartman uh, directory of all the physical props and trying to recreate it in 3D. Can you tell us a bit more about how you did it? Did you do, use any 3D scanning or was it all like recreating by hand? Yeah, so a mi mix of both basically. So Hartman have, um, you know, it, there's, there's digital assets which get used in the films anyway, which you kind of are sort of not supposed to see. So all of, a lot of that stuff exists already, in, as in the characters themselves, um, not for, for game engine necessarily, but as, as CG assets, so something to, to kind of work from. Um, but a lot of the, the props, especially, you know, all the new environments, Mars, that all that kind of thing is, is all new. And so and things like uh, the, the rocket from a grand day out, we're, we're and a lot of times going from image stills from the film, because that's all that is left. There was a fire, I think, at Ardman a few, year, what, 10 years ago or something? Like and a lot of that stuff got, uh, got lost in the fire, unfortunately. But yeah, so we're kind of going from stills from the old film and just sort of recreating them. Directors at Ardman would feedback and, and it would be a process of iteration based on that. Yeah, but the Wallace and Gromit models were scanned. Um, yeah. There was a clip of it in there, but yeah, we basically made them just in clay and scanned them in to get the proportions and the feel right. He also, like, the Wallace and Gromit models have an armature inside. Yes, yeah, they yeah. also based the digital armature on the physical armature. Yeah, basically, and in fact, one of our animators had worked in stop motion, physical stop motion, and then kind of became one of our CG leads, so it was great. And yeah, they always tried to move it as, what's the limitations, which is a challenge, because yeah. they're built to do a certain thing a certain way. If sitting down in a chair should be easy, it's really difficult with a model that has sort of a rigid stomach and yeah, all of that stuff. Hey, if uh, back here, if uh, if Wallace and Gromit wasn't such a well-known, established IP, would you have made any different decisions during the development process? Um, I don't know. I, th I think we were always thinking about the audience and the experience. I think you know it does give you a core to latch it onto, and I think you know it brought a lot of expectations. I think. You know, you, you work with Atlas on Madrid Noir, which was an original IP, and I think that did so well, and you learned a lot that they very consciously wanted to kind of apply that to a known thing, so mm. it was never on the cards to look at it without Wallace and Gromit. I mean, it, more often than not, it was probably a virtue, because, you know, the beauty and the terror of, of virtual reality is anything is possible, and actually having some of this stuff to guide you in terms of, well, how's it going to look? How is it going to move? That really helped, I think. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, working to a brief in a way, because you, you, you have this... Uh, you have this resource element of, of knowledge of what would they do in this situation. You can, they, you can, oh, well, they would do this. And then you can kind of start to build it in or turn the story in that way. So it's, yeah. We, were like, we literally had Nick Park in the writer's room, which was a dream. Um, him and Merlin Crossingham, who are creative directors of, of Wallace and Gromit. I mean, Auto Caddy was from a sketch that Nick Park did. Uh, pretty much at every point, even from the gray boxing, we put them in there and they were very, very useful and very kind. So yeah. Yeah, it was really helpful. So a quick one for each of you. Um, what challenges did you face? You say you're, you're animating on, say, 24 frames per second, but you want the movement and everything to be as high frame rate as possible. Did they have some issues playing nicely together, um, of, like, skipping frames and having the ratios right? In short, yes. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's all kind of over... You, you can overcome it. The, the main uh, difficulty is... is you know, if you're, you're working with between sort of a, a set sequence in, in Unreal Engine of, of anima an animated sequence where you, you want things to happen in a certain timing, certain order, but then you have to interact with, you know, an interactive scene. You have to put loops in there where, you know, characters are idle or waiting for a, an input and then be able to, to kind of kick in an animation at a certain point and have that feel seamless and in that style. That's where it starts to become difficult. But, um, not an insurmountable challenge, but definitely took a while to, to figure that one out. Cool. Yeah. And the other quick one for you is, do you see this being used for digital um, storyboarding moving forward for... Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, Arbor Ar already does actually various bits of kind of real-time production tools, and it, it's been more useful for us to be able to evangelize and show how useful it is. I mean, Gravity Sketch is a great example. Like, the directors latched onto that instantly. I know they've used it on the feature films anyway, um, but I think just having more and more people who have that in their skill set is, is really valuable. Mm. Um, many thanks, guys. Um, please join me in thanking Joseph and Luke.